Are we connected? Yes. Am I audible clearly? Because I'm not using a microphone. Oh, Yes. I was trying from yesterday. Uh, uh, Kavita Srivastava has agreed. Everybody I, I have sent the mail to... Oh, please email. do it. Yeah. You just see that her name is also included. And uh, other things, of course, uh, books and all that. I talked to your assistant in Delhi. That thing is going on. So about this, uh, Kavita has agreed. So just let Amun. No, she doesn't write, but she will, she will send us the circulars and important things related to human rights. Comrade, that's the personal so, conversation. Please mute the conversation. Yeah, she's... Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can ask Amu. I have given her uh, email and uh, her uh, phone number. She can directly coordinate with her. Are we ready to start? Yeah, it is, it is quite, now it is live. Huh? Okay. I think uh, he is on phone. Yes. Uh, we have another two minutes. Yeah. So friends and comrades, the topic of today's webinar is Dr. Ambedkar and challenges before caste inhalation today. It has been organized by caste inhalation movement and revolutionary cultural forum. Tomorrow is December 6. It marks the 64th death anniversary of B.R. Ambedkar and the anniversary of the demolition of Babri Masjid. The demolition of Babri Masjid was not just the destruction of a masjid, but destruction of the progressive and secular values this country has stood for since independence. It is an against, attack against all such structures that stand against the fascist Manuwadi ideals of the right-wing conservatives, as we can see happening in the case of Madhura and Varanasi. With the allegations of blood jihad and laws being passed to curb it, and the increasing atrocities against Dalits, the BJP government seems to be hell-bent on destroying everyone who comes into their way of taking the Hindu agenda forward. As we speak, thousands of farmers are protesting on the roads of Delhi in protest against the Farmers Bill 2020 and Electricity Bill 2020 enacted by the central government under the disguise of COVID pandemic. These bills will put an end to MSPs and will leave farmers at the mercy of the corporates. And today they have reached the 10th day of their protest. The government seems to be least bothered or interested and is talking out new plans to block the farmers from disrupting the, the comfort of their power. On December 8th, the farmers organ farmer organizations have called for a Bharat Bund and we, the caste inhalation movement and revolutionary cultural forum expresses our strong support and solidarity for this month. Now, coming to the topic of caste. In Karnataka, the government has decided to set up barber shops after upper caste persons refused to cut hair of Dalits or ban those shops which are providing the service to the Dalits. In Mysore, a barber was socially boycotted and asked to pay a fine of 50,000 rupees by the leaders of the village for cutting the hair of SCSDs. In Gujarat, a Dalit army jawan's marriage procession was attacked by upper caste people because he was riding a horse. In Hassan, Dalit families have sought police security after they entered a temple and social boycott has been declared against them. And it's also reported that the upper caste have resolved to impose a fine of 10,000 rupees on those who talk to those families. In Hathras, a Dalit girl was gang raped, her tongue pulled out, her spinal cord broken and her body burned by the government so as to cover the evidence of the crime. These incidents reveal that clearly caste is not a thing of the past. It is like a background noise that is always there. When we eat, when we drink, go to get a haircut, go to school or college, go to workplace, decide to get married or even after our birth. 
after her death. The other day I went to a government official's house. They were surprised when I had food there because they said that their upper caste colleagues would not share water with them. And this I'm talking of a government official. I also heard from his wife who's a doctor in the rural areas where she worked, the low caste women do not have the right to say no to an upper caste man who wants to have sex with her. In the comment boxes of news articles on rape of low caste women in social media, we regularly see comments like the upper caste man would never want to pollute himself by touching a low caste woman. She must have gone to them, gone to him. In the movie approached by Govind, Govind Nihlani, we saw Amrish Puri portraying the character of a lawyer who belongs to the low caste say things like this, you know, this is, that is women of low caste getting raped by their upper caste employers. These things happen all the time, but you do not have to make a big deal out of it. The movie reminds one of To Kill a Mockingbird, the book on racism by Harper Lee that was later made into a movie, which criticizes racism in the United States and makes one thing, isn't casteism India's own version of racism? In colleges, students who belong to lower castes are called by their caste names, regularly reminding them of where they belong, of how they are not supposed to be at the temples of knowledge. The case of Rohit Vemula is not much far behind us. Most of our caste words are either casteist or sexist, and we don't even know how it came to be so when we use them. According to Manusmriti, one occupation only the Lord prescribes to the Shudra to sow meekly even these other three castes. That is from chapter one, 91st verse of Manusmriti. And servitude for eternity, that is the only duty prescribed to the lower caste. And it's the same Manusmriti that the right-wing government is at present is trying to replace the constitution with. When I came to North India for the first time, I was used to be faced with this question constantly, what is your surname? And when I say my surname, they would ask me, what does it mean? Don't you have caste-based surnames in the South India? Because only after knowing my caste would they be able to decide whether to treat me as someone inferior or someone at par with them. Because when it comes to finding homes or finding a mate, your caste decides everything. There are many multi-story apartment complexes which do not let out apartments to the lower caste or Muslims. For they intend to keep the purity intact. Have you ever noticed that most of our many main characters of our films are always upper caste? We hear Mishra, Sharma, Tripathi, Chaturvedi, extra. But, we, but rarely do we hear the voices of those lower castes, except in pallet cinemas. We don't see them, we don't hear them, we don't want to have anything to do with them, except when we need our drains cleaned or get our shoes repaired. These fault lines have been further aggravated since 2014, after the right-wing BJP government came into power and started imposing the Brahminical codes of food and dressing. We saw how in Unnav and Hatras, the upper caste Hindus came to the support of the perpetrators of those heinous crimes against low caste women. We see that atrocities against the low caste have risen since the BJP came to power. Also, according to Quiet for Just, Quest for Justice, a report released by the National Dalit Movement for Justice, on an average, 88.5% of cases under the Prevention of Atrocities Act remain pending during trial during 2009 to 2018. And also the government is trying to replace the constitution with Manusprati, a move under the guidance of the RSS theoretical base to further the agenda of a Hindu India, a book which demeans and takes away the dignity of Dalits. And it is from this context that we enter the topic of our discussion, caste Dr. Ambedkar and challenges before caste annihilation movement today. Caste annihilation movement was formed in 2012 with the following objectives to organize continuous campaigns for revolutionary land reforms in order to transform the economic base which perpetuate the caste system. The struggle against all efforts to attack intercaste and interreligious marriages in the name of love jihad, to campaign for equal and compulsory education, housing, healthcare, and employment to all. To campaign for reservation in education, employment, and promotion in both public and private sectors and campaign against creamy layer, reservation based on economic status which values these rights. To campaign against all sort of caste oppression, suppression and discrimination in all forms of life, including practicing untouchability in any form. 
to join hands with all progressive forces in a campaign against the existing caste and communal domination, which imposes dress and food codes, denying the right to consume beef and pork to Dalits and other oppressed sections. Tomorrow, we mark the 64th death anniversary of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the framer of our constitution, but more than that, a foremost leader in the caste, in the fight for caste annihilation. And at a time when the crimes on the basis of caste are increasing like never before, Ambedkar and his ideas seem more relevant. At the time when Ambedkar came out with his ideas of caste annihilation, India had not gone through liberalization and globalization. Nor was there the concept of identity politics, which seems to be eating through the struggle against caste oppression. Ambedkar's own name is used by different organizations which later joined the hands with the Brahminical forces, this demeaning the entire objective. Neo Ambedkarites movements abound mainly for political gains. But different caste groups holding on to their caste to further their agendas, the task of caste annihilation seems to have become even more difficult. Even the right wing forces take up the name of Ambedkar and still go on with their agenda of oppressing the Dalits and the minorities. The time is critical. Because the society at large seems to be getting more and more polarized in the name of religion and in the name of caste. Those who express solidarity with the victims and oppose the Hindutva agenda are branded urban nexus or anti-nationals by the government and the media. It is at this juncture that we have to find a way forward in achieving the goal of caste annihilation using Ambedkarite ideals. To shed more light on this topic, we have with us as keynote speaker, Dr. Ram Puniani, who is a retired professor, IIT Mumbai. He's a consistent fighter against the neo-fascism and has been awarded the National Communal Harmony Award. He has also written many books and articles exposing communalism, majoritarian politics, and fascism. Welcome, Dr. Puniani, to the webinar. We have also with us Comrade Shankar Das. He's, he's a Politburo member of CPML Red Star and is a constant critic of Manuwadi Hindutva politics through his articles. He's also a writer and a cultural activist. Actually, the quotation which I spoke in the beginning is taken from his article only. Com Welcome, Comrade Shankar. And we have with us Comrade B. Lakshmaya, who is a convener of caste annihilation movement. He will be presenting the word of thanks. Welcome, Comrade Lakshmaya, to the webinar. And I would also like to welcome Comrade Kabir Katlar, who has arranged this entire program. And I would also like to welcome all the viewers who are with us in this struggle. After the end of the speech by each speaker, we'll have a question and answer ses session. So you're all requested to send your questions either in the comment box below the Facebook live feed or send it by WhatsApp to 90986-85508. I repeat, 90986-85508. Zero eight. We'd also like to remind you that Caste Annihilation Movement and Revolutionary Cultural Forum are running a campaign against the theoretical base of RSS Manuwadi Hindutva, which has started on September 28th, the birth anniversary of Shahid Bhagat Singh. And the first phase of this campaign will end on December 25th, the anniversary of the burning of Manusmriti by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. And this webinar is part of this campaign. Dr. Puniani, the stage is all yours. Please un unmute yourself, yeah. Thank you very much. How much time I have got? Oh, comrade, uh, you have got one hour? One hour, okay. Yeah. Okay. So to begin with, uh, I must thank uh, Caste Annihilation Movement and this organization for inviting me, giving my generous introduction. And even before I begin my presentation, I must appreciate the introduction given by Vijay Lakshmi. And uh, she has comprehensively outlined most of the issues involved in annihilation of caste in the present circumstances. It is a very good presentation. I think you should uh, try to circulate it. It is uh, because it outlines most of the things. You can slightly upgrade it. And uh, it is a good document. Anyway, friends, this uh, uh, talking a bit personally, I must say that uh, uh, realization about caste 
and importance of B.R. Ambedkar in India's uh, spectrum of uh, thought process uh, began for me particularly after 6 December 1992. Uh, talking a bit personally, I had come to the conclusion that uh, our society can march towards equality, better human rights only through democratic path, number one. Number two, this democratic path can be achieved only through social movements for different issues. And the social movements, which I recognize as uh, taking us further in the journey are the social movements of uh, workers for equal wages, better wages, farmers, which is going on at the moment, women's movement for equality, uh, gender equality, Adivasi's struggle for a dignified life, and lastly, but not the least, the Dalit's struggle for social justice. So these are the five core movements which I identified for myself that these are the movements which can take us towards a society of equality. Now, 6 December, nine, till 6 December 1992, I felt that this communalism, Hindu-Muslim uh, issue, so-called Hindu-Muslim issue, is a temporary thing. It will pass off. So not to worry about it. Let me focus at personal level on workers movement, better rights and more dem democracy at the shop floor and democracy at different working places. That had been my concern. When Babri Mosque was demolished and Mumbai violence gripped Bombay, that time I was shaken from inside and I realized that this Hindu Muslim issue is not just a superficial phenomenon. It is something deep. And it struck me somehow, it struck me that this movement is aim number one, to abolish our democracy. B, to weaken our social movements. And C, to put back, put back Dalits and women in the subordinate position. I must say, I uh, crave your indulgence that whenever I'll be talking about caste, the issue of gender will also be coming in parallelly because to me, these two issues are very much linked. And uh, on caste, social equality, women, gender equality, they run fairly parallel in a democratic process if the democracy, democratic process is allowed to unfurl itself. So the whole issue which came uh, struck me after 6 December 1992 that this communal formation is not just there to oppress the Muslim, to kill the Muslims, to relegate, to the, to relegate them to the margins of the society. I somehow, because of whatever little understanding I had, I felt that this movement has a deeper implication. This has a deeper implication and it is against the process of social justice. It is against the process of uh, Dalits OBC in their struggle for equality. It is against women's march towards gender equality. This somehow struck me because whatever little I had been reading uh, at that time. And that is the time I tried to go into B.R. Ambedkar's issues, uh, issues raised by him. And even at the same time, the issues raised by women's movement related to their equality and their struggle. So this was the background in which I was forced to take up this learning process. And I believe me, you, it was a big learning process. It was a big learning process which unfurled the whole world of Indian society. The deep biases against Dalits, women, Adivasis in our society and the attempt, attempt by Hindu right wing to revive the type of society where rules of Manusmriti are prevalent. So this is the background in which I started to undertake the study of B.R. Ambedkar in, in proper sense. And to my friends and comrades who are uh, here in the, this thing, I must recommend one book right in the beginning. Of course, Ambedkar's writings are massive. Ambedkar's writings are massive. You can spend whole life reading, rereading, interpreting, reinterpreting, and try to come to a better understanding. Of course, Professor Mungekar, Bhalchandra Mungekar, has brought out with a brilliant anthology of Ambedkar's writings. And number two, there is a slim volume, 
very slim volume called Dalit Visions. Dalit Visions by Gail Ombet. All of us who want to understand this issue in depth must have a look at that if that is available. That is by Orient Black Swan. I hope uh, it is still available in this thing. Now, Ambedkar, when we are talking of Ambedkar caste annihilation, we must first try to understand the background in which Ambedkar comes to the social scene. And Ambedkar's coming to the social scene is in the background where already colonial society is set up. Colonial society, British influence, British are come in, British are ruling. They are trying to plunder the wealth of the country. They are trying to put in new education, which is suitable for their administration, new legal system, new jail system, etc., etc. So, of course, uh, humorously, I, uh, I will first uh, try to understand uh, what British aimed at in India. Of course, they came as traders. They came as traders and they controlled the whole country. And at the same time, they ruled plus plundered the country. Shashi Tharoor's brilliant book, The Dark Era of Empire, will tell us how much money they plundered from India. Now, so before this, there is a system of kingdoms. Now, this is very important to understand. The distinction, distinction between kingdoms on one side, colonial period on the other, and period after independence. Period after independence can again be classified into period up to 1990 when some hope of democratic strengthening was there and people after after period after 1990 when communal politics becomes strong and breathing in a democratic air becomes more and more difficult. Now coming back to British and before British, the rulers, Hindu versus Muslim, because the dominant discourse which is prevalent in people's mind is that Indian history was a struggle between Hindus versus Muslims. Hindus versus Muslims, Muslim kings versus Hindu kings. But believe me you, it was not that. It was primarily a contradiction. Actually, uh, I must say the social division was horizontal. Horizontal means at the lower level, the producer, the farmer, his exploiter, the landlord. Landlords, above landlord, the king, above king, the emperor. So this was a social structure. Of course, it is very, very elementary. But what British did, they uh, converted into vertical. Vertical for the sake of division, uh, divide and rule. So they said it Hindu versus Muslim. And that's how, uh, because after 1857, when they realized that it is difficult to rule this country and they must employ the uh, imperial policy of divide and rule, the two sectors which we chose was uh, Hindus versus Muslim. Now, of course, Hindu versus Muslim was never the primary contradiction of Indian society. Primary contradiction is at two levels. One is the producer, the farmer. The other side is the exploiter, landlord, and the king. So this was a primary contradiction. At second level, the other primary contradiction was at one level, Dalits and women on one side and the upper caste males as the dominant social force. So, of course, same thing is there, same historical process is there. So I am outlining three ways of looking at it. The prevalent dominant discourse has been initiated by British, reinforced by the communal forces for their goal, and that sees Hindu versus Muslim. But if you go into the depth of the uh, depth of this kingdoms also, you will see Hindu kings, Muslim kings allied with each other. And the average people, the Hindus and Muslims suffered and celebrated together. So it is not that Hindus were sitting on one side and the Muslims were sitting on the other side. Actually, of course, caste division was there, that, that's another. But the primarily, it is kings fighting with each other not for religion, for power and wealth. Kings allying with each other, like of course, Akbar is there, but with Akbar, there is Raja Todarmal, there is Raja Birbal. Aurangzeb, the most hated Muslim king is there, but with him, there is Raja Jai Singh, Raja Jaswan Singh, and 33% of his associates are Hindus. Okay, so this is a uh, thing, and even the battles have been presented uh, because communal forces have presented these battles as 
great Hindu warriors versus the cruel Muslim aggressor. It was not like that. Kings were fighting not for religion. They were ruling, fighting for power and wealth. And one, just one battle example I'll give. You can see about Tipu Sultan also. But one battle example I'll give you is that between Akbar and Rana Pratap. You will remember Rana Pratap is being projected now as the great Hindu nationalist. He was a king. We are in a nation state. We see every subtle difference. Rana Pratap, Shivaji, they are being presented as great Hindu nationalists. They were not, that time nation was not, nation state was not there. But this is a beauty, not sorry, sorry, not beauty, brilliance. A shrewd brilliance of communal forces that they are trying to collapse the history in such a way. Anyway, Rana Pratap, Akbar. Ground of Haldighati in Rajasthan. Two kings are fighting and on Akbar's side, Akbar's forces, Akbar himself is not there. Akbar's army is being represented by Raja Man Singh. And on Rana Pratap's side, apart from Rana Pratap, there is Hakim Khan Sur. It is a mixed army on both the sides. But today, what people are being drilled with, Muslims versus Hindus, which was not there at all. See, all our culture, I'm talking, sorry, more of Northern culture, sorry for to our moderator, particularly in Northern culture, if you see many festivals, Holi begins from the land, Muslim landlord of the village. Diwali, recently I came across a beautiful article by my friend, Diwali. Diwali, of course, I, after knowing the reality of it, I don't celebrate it much. But at that time also, Diwali was celebrated in a great way by Mughal kings. They used to call it just a charaga. Just means festival. Charag means uh, the lamb, the festival of lambs. It was a great celebration in that. And of course, I'll request my friends, though, though you, it may sound a bit elementary, if you have time sometime, do enjoy a uh, classic of uh, my times, which is Mughal Azam. There you will see the integration of the Hindu and Muslim culture in a beautiful way. Then there are poets like Rahim Raskhan talking about Sri Krishna. Then there are people like uh, in the present time also, uh, the great uh, friend of ours, Javed Akhtar, writing brilliant poetry on Lord Krishna. Similarly, many Hindus also wrote things which were like it. So basic point is that was not a period of hostility on the ground of religion. The hostility, the contradiction was between the poor peasant and the rich landlord. The contradiction was between the upper caste and the suppressed Dalits and women on one side. Anyway, British come, British come and they introduce some changes. And of course, as we know, very elementary, society is constantly changing. Society is constantly changing in our own, in my own lifetime. I have seen how with great adulation we saw the Soviet revolution, the October revolution, how it later on went into perestroika, glasnost, and how in the current times in the Russia, a different type of thing. So society is constantly changing. British brought certain changes and these changes, this is the background in which Ambedkar is coming. Just wait for four or five minutes, Ambedkar is coming on the scene. So British introduced, uh, to remember humorously, I put it three major changes. One is transport, rail. Second is communication, telephone, telegraph, postal system, mail. And third is modern education, modern judicial system, and modern punitive system, and punitive system represented by jail. So three things you will always remember, rail, mail, and jail. Okay. Now with this, three new social classes come up. I'm very glad I don't have to explain you what are social classes. Because other meetings I have to explain a class means type of people doing similar type of work. I don't have to explain to friends like you. Now, so three new social classes come up. What are these three new social, new social classes? Number one, businessmen industrialist. Tata, Birla, Bajaj, Singhania, Dalmia. They set up the factories and in the factories come up the modern working class. And the third group which comes up is the modern educated people. So remember, these are the rising classes. 
and the older classes are not decimated away in france when the industrial revolution comes the old classes are thrown into the dustbin of history the old rulers are thrown into the dustbin of history and that alliance of king and the clergy landlord and the clergy it is wiped out from the society so the democratic society begins from a clean slate in india new classes come up the old rulers landlords rajas hindus nawab they also continue it is a coexistence of course peaceful coexistence is something else but say coexistence which becomes painful in much later time now one good thing british did was introduction of the process of formation of organizations from the rising classes many organizations come up for the lack of time i'll put three representative classes with a request that try to see the pattern of their names what are these three new classes which are uh, three new uh, representative organizations number 1 shahid bhagat singh naujawan bharat sabha number 2 bhimrao baba saheb ambedkar many organizations culminating is his concept of republican party of india and the organization which led the freedom movement i am not propagating to vote for them don't worry about that that indian national congress with representatives like maulana abul kalam azad any besant sardar baldev singh and mohandas karamchand gandhi so these are the rising classes and the declining classes raja nawab zamindar jagirdar landlords they also form a organization which is they are hindus and muslims are together in the beginning later on because of british policy of divide and rule they get divided initially in these organizations please note and here this is very important in these organizations initially only landlords and kings were there later on some elite educated upper caste type of people joined them and they gave them leadership also some of the one organization which comes up is basically based around the uh, around the one upper caste group so what are these sections coming from the declining sections of society Three, three representatives. Number one, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Muslim League, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, Hindu Mahasabha, and the organization which is overarching every other organization today, which wants Hindu nation. What is the name of that? Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh. See the pattern of names. Rising classes, changing values, going towards democracy, and those. who have roots in the feudal system so here there is naujawan bharat sabha republican party of india bharatiya rashtriya congress and here there is muslim league hindu mahasabha and for hindu nation rss i hope you got my point basically they were standing and aspiring for a india where they, which is inclusive which is inclusive which should go towards liberty equality fraternity and justice and what are these fellows struggling for these fellows are struggling for retaining their old privileges and see their brilliance their crooked brilliance they want to retain their privileges because with the coming up of the rising classes their privileges are going away so they say and very 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 shrewdly they say they don't say that our power is declining they say our religion is in danger so for a muslim nawab he is losing his power but he is saying islam khatre mein islam in danger and hindu rajas and current hindutva politics they will say hinduism is in danger believe me you religions are not in danger it is a social power political power of few groups which is in danger anyway so now how do i summarize the value system of rising classes declining classes here from rising classes i pick up my favorite example of bhimrao baba saheb ambedkar i'll go, go into detail but this just to group these two things and bhimrao baba saheb ambedkar he for social justice launches lot of movements i will not go into details of that but one symbolic thing he does is burning of manusmriti burning of while burning of burning of manusmriti he must have thought that manusmriti gives the provisions of slavery for shudras and women i am against that 
So I'm getting this book burned. Same Ambedkar goes on to become the chairman of drafting committee of Indian constitution, which gives us what? Liberty, equality, fraternity, and justice. So this is the rising classes and the declining classes. One example I'll give you uh, for these days, so many BJP leaders and I'll go to their boss, big organization, their patriarchal organization, their patriarch RSS. In 2000, there was one Sar Sangh Chalak. I hope you know this word, Sar Sangh Chalak, Supreme Dictator. And uh, uh, that was K. Sudarshan. K. Sudarshan, in uh, Outlook magazine, he gave a statement. It has been erased. You know, uh, there is a wonderful IT cell taking away all the things which are uncomfortable. But somehow, I happened to write an article on that, which I have preserved somewhere. So what does Mr. Sudarshan say? The boss of RSS, he says, Indian constitution is based on Western values. He doesn't say it is based on the modern values. He doesn't say that it is based on equality. That is not acceptable. So he calls it Western. Throw it away and bring a constitution based on holy Indian books. So what is a holy Indian book? It can't be Quran. It can't be Bible. So it has to be Manusmrati. See the contradiction. Ambedkar is burning Manusmrati, bringing an Indian constitution. And this Hindu nationalist politics wants Indian constitution to go away and the values prevalent at the time of Manusprati to come back. So this is the background in which we must understand Ambedkar's role in the whole process. When I was talking of the rising classes, in addition to rail, mail and jail, there are two major processes which are taking place. What are these two major processes? One is introduction of modern education to Dalits. Remember Jyoti Rao Phule. These names are very important. Mahatma Jyoti Rao Phule, he says, education is accessible to Dalits, but they are afraid because from centuries, they have been told that you can't get education. You, you either, if you learn on your own, you will become a club there. Otherwise, if you hear the holy words, you, your ear will be, uh, uh, molten lead will be put in your ears. And if you speak the holy words from Vedas, your tongue will be cut. So full it spells, don't worry about this. This is what gives you slavery. Come to the modern education. This will be the path of your liberation. So encouragement of education to Dalits and his wife. But I'm saying his wife, but don't take it in that sense. She was a independent authority in her own self. Savitri Bai Phule. Savitri Bai Phule starts the school for girls. Today, of course, I'm so happy that our moderator is a girl. But that time, education for girls was unthinkable. And when she, along with his uh, uh, colleague, Fatima Sheikh, started the school for girls, people said, this is against our religion. Our religion says women should be in the confines of their homes. And they start wanted to stop Savitri Bai Phule in her tracks. They used to throw stones on her, mud on her, and cow dung on her. Of course, cow dung is very sacred. These so I should not use that word. So cow dung on her. But undaunted by that, she continued to go to the school. Then they started another method. What was that method? Starting rumors. And of course, you know, rumors are very powerful. They spark of communal violence. And sometimes they make Ganpati, Ganesh, Idol to drink the milk also. Power of rumors. Anyway, I am coming from a science background, but I must concede the power of rumors is very great. So they started a rumor against women's education. What was that rumor? that those girls who will get educated will become widows very fast. At a lighter note, I said, this was a rumor and I can prove it from my own life. From my own life, I hope I can prove it. My wife is a very well-educated MBBS doctor. Till this minute, she is not a widow, despite tolerating me for 40 long years. Anyway, that's a personal story. Now, in this, here comes Ambedkar. So here there is Jyoti Rao Phule, there is Savitri Bai Phule, there is a beginning of education amongst Dalits, beginning of education amongst women. And when Phule, Dr. Ambedkar, after getting the maximum possible 
degrees maximum possible uh, does not get a job and when he gets a job people are scared of giving him water people don't touch the files which he which he is dealing with and from here he goes into launching goes on to become the principal of the law college teaches there and at the same time he starts one paper another paper or forms one organization another organization and two major things which he does was one was for social equality he uh, that dalits should also have access to public drinking water public drinking water he led a satyagraha satyagraha and please note in the satyagraha men were there women were also there that is very remarkable of this type of thing because when i come to rss i will try to explain that it is exclusively male organization in which women have a subordinate role structurally in that organization in that ideology etc etc okay so chaudhar tala what does he say he says the animals are drinking water from the tank but you are not permitting we the dalits to have water from that so he took him uh, satyagraha there he was they were beaten up then he said you regard us as hindus let us come to temples but again they were beaten and it is after this that he got manusmriti burn and he stated that i was born in a hindu family but i let me explain his understanding of hinduism his practice his experience of hinduism was that hinduism is in the grip of brahmanism this is very important to understand because at the same time another person was uh, saying the word hindu and trying to unite the country uh, with great amount of tolerance and patience so anyway so ambedkar experienced the brahmanical hinduism and he said i was born in a hindu family that was not in my hands but i will not die in this family and uh, in this in this religion and later on of course before his death he embraced buddhism and his basic concept for buddhism accepting buddhism was a concept of equality which was there lord gautam buddha had uh, already talked of this now whole ambedkar philosophy was centered around struggle of this caste inequality and he studied the caste system in india and his book who were the shudras uh, which was written we uh, written as a lecture but not accepted by the jat pat todak mandal in punjab so he published it as a separate book his basic point was that indian society has caste system and this caste system is very rigid inflexible and it has to be annihilated remember the word annihilation i am glad you use the word annihilation because today those people who are there to maintain the status quo to push back the dalits into subordinate position they are using the word caste harmony a bit of a hindi samrasta they say kai different castes are there there should be harmony between the caste over ambedkar says no question of harmony in the caste this caste system itself should be annihilated and that's how he, he one of the things he said was inter caste marriages and when you think of love jihad when you think of that do you think they are doing it just for, against muslims no 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 their basic point is that every independence to girl every inter caste marriage it's a attack on the rigid brahminical notions which are the base of hindu nationalism so anyway so ambedkar then traces the history of the caste and of course there are three major theories of the caste system one is by martin claus he says that as production became surplus the new caste started coming up then there is dd kosambi who says that as different uh indigenous groups merged into the urban societies the caste system was created but ambedkar here has a opinion that caste system is purely dictated by not by race not by anything but by the hindu holy scriptures basically brahminical holy uh, strict uh, this thing brahminical uh, holy scriptures here let me point out one thing he burnt manusmriti but another at another place he also says the gita 
which is most revered by uh, many people quoted as the uh, the holy uh, hindu book he says gita is manu smriti in nutshell just i am giving it a food for thought because there also lord shri krishna says whenever the dharma is in danger i take birth what is this dharma dharma is varnashram dharma brahman kshatri vaishya shud anyway so ambedkar gives his theory of caste uh, caste and then he regards three major steps in the anti caste struggle in india these three major struggles which took place first he uh, and these three people he calls them as his guru guru is of course now a accepted word in even oxford dictionary so i don't have to translate guru has a very unique this thing so he regards now first his first guru is lord gautam buddha and you will see gautam buddha's compassion love equality they are all part of what ambedkar believes his second guru is sant kabir here i want to re- request my friend that please don't confuse the saint system now again i am careful saint of course these days are, are many saints are there only few of them are in jails others are working outside i am not talking of those saints i am talking of me- medieval saint kabir tukaram namdev narsi mehta on similar lines mohinuddin chishti nizamuddin aulia these saints basically focused on the morality of religion inclusiveness of society and celebration with the ordinary people so second he takes kabir as the example because those who read read kabir in detail they he just doesn't talk of hindu muslim unity he is harshly against the priestly class priestly class not only in the hindus but also in the muslims that's why muslim rulers were against him hindu rulers were also against him because according to kabir the social system is maintained on one side by the kings and legitimized by the clergy we have a wrong notion that king and the pope alliance was only in europe please note landlord clergy alliance is all over in the feudal pattern of society so that kabir becomes his second guru and his third guru is a uh, jyotira phule whose work very preceding to him who tells that uh, this caste system and all that jyotira phule uh, speaks very eloquently he uh, his social action is very important through which he tries to unite uh, he tries to uplift the dalits in the, in his society so here comes what are the obstacles to the annihilation of caste now as i said on one side rising classes are coming up on the other side there are declining rulers who do not want to part with their ideology and in this of course one is muslim league i will not much talk detail about it muslim league mainly muslim communalism fundamentalism operative in pakistan they have already ruined the pakistani society of course we are also going on the same path if i am not wrong so muslim communalism i leave out but hindu communalism as hindu mahasabha comes up and Savarkar is the first major philosopher ideologue of Hindu Mahasabha he says there are two nations here hindus and muslims savarkar goes on to criticize buddhism can you realize why because buddhism buddhism is talking of equality savarkar is against untouchability savarkar is for temporal entry by shudras but as far as varna caste system is there they are fully for that then comes in 1925 rss and here two major things i will uh, you please remember first is 1925 and second is 1990 i'll explain what is 1990 1925 why rss comes up now generally the impression of about rss is that it is anti muslim but believe me you anti muslim is just a visible part of rss agenda uh hello can you hear me yeah yes, no, we can hear you you can hear huh. yes so believe me you uh, this is just a visible part of the rss agenda in 1920s what happens if you know first time mahatma gandhi involves average people into the anti british struggle 
so the social hierarchy which was there starts breaking and so elite and upper caste start feeling threatened and number 2 in nagpur vidarbh area i hope you know rss head office is in nagpur i hope you know that in rss head office there was a portrait of hitler i hope you know that rss there is a uh, big collection of arm armaments different type of armament which our glorious hindu kings were using against the oppressive muslim kings that is all where rss head office is there anyway so rss comes up and the third background because of which rss comes up rss comes up because upper caste elite feel threatened number 1 because average people are participating in the freedom movement number 2 because the dalits in nagpur vidarbh area inspired by jyoti rao phule inspired by bhim rao baba saab ambedkar launch a movement called non brahmin movement its title is non brahmin movement but it is target against the landlords in our maharashtra there is a very a very catchy word called shedji bhagji shedji means landlord bhagji means a priest so when they are targeting it against brahmins basically they are targeting against landlordism so when this comes in they come to form rss and rss takes its inspiration from the nationalism promoted by hitler and mussolini that's a long story i will not go into the detail of this anyway so rss at one level uh, basically uh, annihilation of caste is on one side and rss is on the other side wanting to preserve the caste system in a different way that's why its ideologue uh, uh, that is more popular golwalkar these is they are trying to name lot of uh, 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 scientific institutions in the name of golwalkar imagine scientific institutions in the name of golwalkar that is the latest trend thanks not where we are landing up in our country where people like jawaharlal nehru talked of promotion of scientific scientific uh, temper there we are going to have institutions of science named in the name of golwalkar and golwalkar stated golwalkar stated that india's uh, in india lord manu was the greatest philosopher and Comrade, is there? His connect connection is there is a problem in his connection. Okay. Please wait for few minutes. Okay. Yeah, you audible now. Please go on. So it trains pracharaks and it gives a narrative. It gives a narrative. Uh, which is indoctrinated into people's head, and what is that narrative? Uh, ancient glorious past, when Manu Smriti ruled, when the caste and gender system was applicable, that is regarded as a golden ancient period. How was a golden ancient period spoiled? Because of Muslims, because of Christians, they came here, they tried to convert the people. all 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 bunkum nothing truth about it they tried to uh, convert the people so the caste system became unequal they are lecherous so we had to protect our women so all that sati and all that came so projecting internal problems to the external source brilliant move brilliant move problem is within the society but you blame the outside for that anyway before coming to the 1990 and why hindu nationalism surged up after 1990 i must say swayam sevaks pracharaks are given full indoctrination you all must be remembering our uh, that president pranab mukherjee who got bharat ratna you know why he got bharat ratna according to me he went to rss rss uh, convocation when this uh, six month long training is given and uh, pranab mukherjee praise headge war the founder of rss so obviously he deserved a bharat ratna nothing short of that will do so they gave a long training and comrades i must blame ourselves i am including myself with you their training is round the year all the days of the week all the years of the month all the months of the year and round the clock 
three months, six months, one year training, and then you become pracharak and fully indoctrinated with the ideology of a Hindu nation, Hindu nationalism. Now, we get independence. RSS keeps quietly proliferating at the same time when uh, around communist parties form. Brilliant work. Our understanding is that of class struggle. Very correct. I fully agree with that. And it gives us a lot of enrichment in understanding the social exploitation. No match about it. But the Indian reality of caste system never gripped our comrades. Even why, why blame others? Even I, even I, till 1992, did not realize that caste system is one of the core things to understand. And this Ambedkar's guru and Ambedkar himself realized. Jyotirao Phule writes, in, he has a book called Shet Karachi Asur, uh, means uh, uh, Cultivator's Whip Cord, in which he says, the same person belongs to lower caste and same person is a labor. At one level, he is exploited socially. At one, another level, he is exploited economically. See the synthesis which Jyotira Phule brings into his study. And Ambedkar does the same thing. You know what is the first party which he formed? It was Independent Labour Party. Why he forms Independent Labour Party? He says, all people of my caste belong to the working class. So what party will be the best? So it is Independent Labour Party. Anyway, let's not go into what mistakes we have done in the past. But basically, to understand the society in an organic way, to see that exploitation is social, exploitation is economic, and exploitation is gender-based. If we synthesize these three in our organic thinking, we can counter, begin to understand how do we counter the great threat which has come to our democracy. Now, of course, India gets independence. Ambedkar writes the uh, uh, constitution. After that, slow changes start taking place. When I was 30s, in my 20s and 30s, I said, oh, what is happening? Things are so slow. Nehru is not doing anything. Country is uh, still poor. Of course, that's what logically you should always be. We are in the permanent opposition. Like whosoever, whatever are their weaknesses, we criticize that. But today in the hindsight, we can see what Nehru did and what Ambedkar did founded modern India. Because of that, Dalits started coming to the social space. Women started coming to the social space. And partly Adivasis also coming, started coming to the social space. And by 1980, by 1980, the social dynamics changes. The upper caste, the affluent people start realizing that Dalits are coming into the society. OBCs are coming into the society. Women are making small headway. And that's where religiosity is invoked. Please note, this religiosity was not natural the way my, my grandfather was religious. It is not that religiosity. It was a constructed religiosity around Ram Temple. And its explanation was given by none other than that uh, prime minister who used to write poetry, who was also called right man in the wrong party. Of course, I think he was a wrong man in the wrong party. He, he's, he, I hope you have guessed, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. In 1990, V.P. Singh brings in Mandal Commission report. And in Mandal Commission, when Mandal Commission is brought in, Vajpayee later on says, they brought in Mandal, we brought in Kamandal. I hope you know the meaning of the word Kamandal. Kamandal with the sadhus carry a religiosity. So after that, Rathyatra, temple, this issue started becoming important. And at the same time, targeting of Muslims and Dalits started going up. Now, as you correctly pointed out, I am indicating to our uh, moderator that atrocities against Dalits have gone up from 1914 onwards. There must be nearly 20 to 30 percent increase in the anti-Dalit atrocities, in the anti-women atrocities, incidents of rape are becoming horrific, etc., etc. And this is what has been the period of last six years. So, question is that subtle policies pursued by this government, which wants to go towards Hindu nationalism, which has created a narrative around that. It kept raising, I'll just uh, wind up in four, four, five, six minutes, kept raising issues, emotive issues. 
Bhagat Singh Ambedkar will talk of bread, butter, shelter, employment, education, dignity, human rights. And they started talking of Ram Temple. Gau, cow is our mother. Of course, they can't take care of their own mother, but cow is our mother. Beef eating is equal to killing. Love jihad. Actually, in younger days, I used to feel love doesn't know any boundaries, including that of religion. But now, of course, at old age, I can't recite these sentences. So now love jihad has come up. And all those issues. You Can you believe that even Corona, which the world is suffering, the media related to this particular party tried to blame it on the Muslims. Corona jihad, Corona bomb, etc., etc. I mean, that was the limit what Goebbels must have shaken in his grave that day. That somebody can surpass me so much is must have been a real surprise to that. So friends, this whole thing which is going on from last 25-30 years, uh, I, I feel that this is basically to distract. Of course, there is a big topic. I will not go into that. However, democratic institutions are being constrained as if somebody is throttling them. How our uh, democratic values are going under the sides. How the sufferings of Adivasis, Dalits, women and workers are increasing. That is there for everybody to see. So my point here is that when we are talking of annihilation of caste, RSS devised a very clever strategy. And this is three-pronged strategy. One is a strategy of Sanskritization, bringing in religion, promoting religion into the Dalit areas. And there is a very good study by, I'm forgetting the name of one young scholar, who did that whenever RSS wants to enter a Dalit Basti, they go and start Vinayaka festival, Ganpati, Ganesh festival. They give the money to start it. And then all things are motivated around that. Second is, they are trying to bring in Dalit icons, praise them without their values. Like these days, you may not be celebrating Ambedkar so much as RSS affiliated organizations do. But for them, I, Ambedkar is a photo. Ambedkar is not the values of equality. Third, they try to co-opt co -opt some of the Dalit leaders. You must have heard of Chirag Paswan. Earlier, my great friend who's currently in jail, Anand Tel Dumre. Uh, in, I think, Modi cabinet, there were three Ra Ram Vilas Paswan, uh, then uh, Ram Das Athavle, and uh, Ram Raj, Udit Raj. Three Rams were there in Modi cabinet. So, Tel Tumde called that these are Hanumans of the government. Now, Chirag Paswan himself says, I am Hanuman for Modi. So, this type of indoctrination by selfish, narrow interest of few Dalit leaders. And fourth is social engineering, in which through constant propaganda, they try to project to Dalits that you are Hindus, we are brethren, and our real enemy is Muslims. So these are the four steps through which they do it. So now, how do we come back to the path of caste annihilation, which should be our goal, as was the goal of Dr. Ambedkar? Number one. RSS has become powerful because of polarization. Polarization has come up because of communal violence. Communal violence could be orchestrated because of the hatred produced against minorities. Hatred could be produced against minorities because of the misconceptions in the society. Muslims bad, Christians bad, Christians convert, Muslims are terrorists, Muslims destroyed our temples, they converted by four, they marry four number of times, they lure our girls. So hatred against Muslims. So we have to go the same way around. First, try to create a understanding which counters most of these understandings in a true way. And I will share with you, if you don't mind, sorry, I keep talking about myself because uh, I have written a uh, small booklet, 69 questions about what people believe and what is the truth. I will share it with you as a soft copy. You can use it, number one. So these need to be countered. In people's, actually, what people think, social common sense is very important. Remember Noam Chomsky's word of manufacturing consent. America could attack one country after the other because through media, it could win the consent of the people. And RSS today can orchestrate things because it has won over people's mind to some extent. Not full extent, but that's where we have to work. We have to try to bring the 
bondings between different religious communities number 3 we have to see that all social movements all social movements which i have listed five six type of social movement we are there i salute the great comrades who are working in this but we have one flaw that flaw is that we are very scattered we work for the same cause but we can't see eye to eye with each other maybe ideological differences ego clashes etc etc time has come to save our democracy and for saving our democracy we have to work shoulder to shoulder without dissolving our organizational identity keep it this is very valuable but ally with those who are working in the similar causes work shoulder to shoulder with every other social movement which strengthens democracy which talks of equality which talks of abolition of caste which talks of gender equality and i don't see that these are different issues they are deeply connected there is a deeper organic connection between the two and what is that organic connection that organic connection is a march towards democracy when we say equality equality doesn't mean that there is ambani on one side and a beggar on the other it also includes economic equality when we talk of equality it means equality between genders also equality between different castes also so that's where i think uh, but one last ray of hope i will say i have said so many pessimistic negative things last i can't help that pessimism is creeping in slowly but i try to keep it alive by looking at young people like you and looking at other young people who are articulating ambedkar's values bhagat singh's values in a very refreshing way you may disagree with them at some places but they have made a great impact friends like young friends like jignesh mewani kanaiya kumar and uh, umar khaled shaila rashid why i am taking their names because somewhere at the age of 75 i have to look for the ray of hope for tomorrow and for the future it is through these efforts by strengthening our movements and by working shoulder to shoulder with cause based movement issue should be important and as they say in english let's march separately if necessary let's march separately if necessary but let's strike together let's strike together and that's where our recognition for others contribution should be very much there so as far as we believe in liberty equality fraternity and justice we try to ally we try to support other organization other movements so that the movements become strong and strong movements are the only guarantee for a proper democratic society strong movements are the only guarantee that we can overcome caste caste differences gender differences and restoration of adivasis in the normal stream of life thank you very much she told me that i should stop in between i requested her that you should stop me neither she stopped me nor i stopped myself so sorry for that but your questions i'll take at the end thank you so much okay. thank you so much Uh, thank you comrade so what happened was i was supposed to stop you in, in between we were supposed to have an interactive session but i got into it so much that you know i didn't want to stop <laughs> the flow <laughs> so thank it was you. like usually i don't like history sessions so this time i was like sitting in the first bench and watching watching the entire show you know <laughs> thank, thank you sir so thank, thank you thank you thank you for this because i mean this is the first time getting so much of a refreshing perspective on indian history i haven't ever seen it this way you know representative classes and you know dominating yeah. and declining classes i know it must be the same for all of viewers and uh, yes, another thing is what usually people don't touch upon bhagavad gita usually people criticize this manuspriti only and uh, they don't go upon vedas or uh, bhagavad gita even though it is bhagavad gita which, which says in one chapter chaturvarnya maya srishtam guna tanma vipagasah so in that krishna yes. says chaturvarnya has created my me and it is based on this guna and karma triguna and on the karmic basis so it is from that only so we also don't yes. touch upon that and even gandhi has written mm -hmm. a book called karma yoga and we usually usually keep bhagavad gita to the side because we consider it a secular text but it is not so so rightly you pointed yes. out that and we have questions can i start We have, yeah. At your disposal. <laughs> so the first yeah. question is: I remember Ambedkar said caste is not created by Manusmriti, but 
put uh, a stamp of holiness and authority. If I am correct, why and how caste came into existence? It is not an academic question because to annihilate, one should have a clarity of its origin. Yeah. See, uh, that way, you know, Indian system, actually, there is another theory that there is something called Asiatic mode of production. Uh, we have sort of a self-sufficient village uh, and that is a uh, possibility of a village becoming self-sufficient is there. Now I'm talking the material base and uh, because if you are too much dependent on others, then interaction takes place. Here, if the life is there in the single village, which is self-sufficient, then there is a possibility of this caste system developing very strongly. And when the system developed, the dominant people legitimized it. They legitimize it. So that's why later on Ambedkar says that it is the scriptures. It is because of the scriptures that caste system gets rooted. So there are two things. One is the formation of the caste system. And second is legitimization and rooting of the caste system, which again, our holy so-called holy scriptures bring into the uh, action. And uh, that's what we are, I think we need to think about it. So uh, Comrade, there is another one. Uh, how do we deal with the neo Ambedkarites in our struggle for caste annihilation? Because they don't accept us and we also don't accept their ideology, yes, but we yes, have to yes. go along. Like you said, even though we march separately, we have to strike together. So how do we do it? Yeah, yeah that's a very million dollar question, I must say. See, what happened that uh, in uh, we are all identified. I am in the boat with which you are riding. And uh, we are identified as left thinkers. And later on, of course, you know, when the Communist Party and Ambedkar, they had some electoral problems. So Communist Party did not support him. And this fact is propagated broadcast by the right wing very strongly. Actually, Ambedkar concedes that socialism is the best system. He says, I am closest to socialism. And on the other side, it is communists who are closest to socialism. But what right wing has done very cleverly, they have picked up some difference here, some difference there and enlarge it. So what we can do, like uh, here I appreciate Kanahiya Kumar, where he has uh, coined a slogan called Jai Bhim Lal Salam. Now that is symbolic. That is symbolic. And secondly, if uh, uh, there is a film by Anand Patwardhan, Anand Patwardhan, you must see all, all his films, especially his latest one, Vivek Reason. And one of his uh, five mammoth five hour film, of course, he's a great person, but we also curse him that he makes long films. Beautiful, a total elaboration. There is a film called Jai Bhim Comrade. Look at the word, Jai Bhim Comrade. So the whole effort is to see how these two things can be brought together. And we must leave all our arrogance. We have gone through Marx. We have gone through different philosophers who have been talking of equality. We believe in equality. But in Indian reality, how do we accommodate it with them? How do we support? their struggles, like you very well brought out Rohit Vemula. You know how much big movement was there uh, after Rohit Vemula's uh, institutional murder? So we should be part of all this. See, one is that we send a message and second is our actions, our actions. In our actions, if we are supporting them, we are rubbing shoulders with them, I'm sure we'll be able to bridge this gap. It's a question of time. Even Jignesh Mevani, he's not allergic to, allergic to left people. And Kanhaiya Kumar from the left, he is very much bringing in Ambedkar in every of his this thing. So today, of course, Gandhi, if we say a lot of controversies come, Gandhi has done his role, he has united the country, he got us freedom. But today, the two icons which we have to match together is Bhagat Singh on one side and Ambedkar on the other. So we will have to find very creative ways of associating with Dalit movement. And I think the onus is on us, onus is on you and me that we try to associate with them. We try to remove their misconceptions. And these misconceptions cannot be done only through articles or essays. They have to be done on the street. They have to be done through the struggles. They have to be done by standing firmly against every atrocity against Dalits. That's what will give a proper message. So that's what I feel. It's difficult. It's, it is easier said than done, but we have to do it. Without that, Social movements cannot progress. Without that, democracy cannot be restored. Yes. Which brings me to the next question. I mean, you talked about caste. But uh, caste is a phenomenon that is unique to the Indian subcontinent. 
So why yeah. is it so? Yeah, see this, as I said, there is something called Asiatic mode of production. Wherever the society is very stable, uh, environmental, uh, this uh, weather conditions are not very bad and people can be self-sufficient. This may be one of the things. And as I was saying that in India, peculiarly uh, the whole world, there cannot be a uniformity. There cannot be a uniformity. The caste is unique to India because of many of the historical situations, many of the geographical situations, because of which the caste came and it became perpetuated. To me, I think I can see only one reason and that is uh, what I read a bit about Asiatic mode of production. Then as I told you about D.D. Kosambi also feels that many of the indigenous people who were coming out from jungles, uh, forests, they were trying to fuse with the society. And in that, some differentiation came up which some powerful elite tried to intensify. So that is a reality. We can't do much about it. But as I, I told you also about Mort, Morton, Morton class, uh, his theory, it is because of the surplus and et cetera, et cetera. So these three main theories we, we have to relook. Uh, and peculiarity of India's geography has a lot of role to play in this origin of caste system in India. Uh, the next question is, how do you deal with caste annihilation in a country which is so polarized? You know, I mean, at, I mean, uh, I am 30. So when I was getting older, I mean, like I was growing up. So uh, there was a scope. I mean, we used to believe that this caste system was going to end because people are earning more. It is an era of globalization and privatization and the young children, they get money in their hands pretty early. And they don't have to go by the values or the beliefs that the parent believed in because they are exposed to the Western concepts and everything. But still, we haven't seen this happening. The youth now is also much polarized when you see you talk to them. Yeah. yeah. So how is it so? See, uh, after 1980s, if you see, uh, basic reason I feel that India's secularization process. I gave the example of France and many other European countries, if you see, when the democratic industrial modern society, all terms may not be ac accurate, but democratic modern nation state comes, the landlord and the clergy, their power is reduced. They are either annihilated or at least at social scale, their power, like in France, many of them were annihilated. In uh, some countries in Europe, they were not annihilated. They were just kept aside from the power structure. Like in um, England, Still, the queen is ruling, but that's the most democratic country. So, different type of uh, things come up. So, uh, in India, the because of the colonial, it was a colonial state. In colonial state, British were not interested in wiping out the landlords. British were not interested in wiping out the landlords and this thing. So, they also continued. As I said, rising classes came up. Declining classes also continued. And they were most loyal to the British. Today, many of the them say, oh, we were uh, this thing, uh, like even RSS was never a part of freedom movement. RSS was never a part of freedom movement. Hindu Mahasabha was never a part of freedom movement. And uh, even Muslim League was not a part of freedom movement. So today they may say anything, but they wanted to retain their privileges. And with privileges, British had also no problem. So British also let them continue. So what we call as a land reform. Now here comes a crucial word, which we can understand better land reform could never be implemented fully. And when the land reform is not implemented, the power of the landlord and the clergy in some modified form continues. So in from 1950 to 1980, if you see, the hold of communalism was not so much. But after 1990s decade, if you see, it is a sort of a throwback to the past. Those elements who were trying uh, to retain their privileges now they change their form and they see the occasion. And again, it is a, uh, also I must say, the role of RSS is very phenomenal because they kept working quietly. We never heard of quiet, like till 1917, 80, RSS was never recognized as a power. Even now they work from the shadows, but they work the hardest, believe me you, they work the hardest in indoctrinating the young boys between the age of five to 15. And that may also is additional reason as to why caste is not going. So one is number one, secularization process did not take place. Elements of landlordism and clergyism that continued. And number three, the subjective factor of the role of RSS that has intensified the whole thing. 
uh, comrade we have always seen that uttar pradesh tops tops the list of atrocities against dalits i mean this the data brought out by the uh, ncrb so for the past many years up has been topping the list why is it the case i mean what is so special about uttar pradesh that it happened so much in there yeah see actually there is some difference between the northern states and the southern states uttar pradesh is a was in the this sense again it is very much related to the land reforms number 1 number 2 in southern states this uh, reservation for obcs came in much earlier in 1950s there was a talk of obc reservation and that started getting implemented and in so like kerala the land reform is uh, much better than others so here all states have behaved very very differently uttar pradesh has uh, not like uh, even when it became independent uh, gb pant govind vallabh pant who was the first chief minister of up he was fairly a right winger so from there the roots of landlordism were preserved clergism was preserved so uttar pradesh may be is and of course you see there is a word called bimaru states bimaru state up bihar rajasthan and madhya pradesh we are uh, also called cow belt where rss has been the strongest so here the process of land reforms the process of affirmative action for dalits and obcs has been weaker and that's why the things are much worse there so in the states where affirmative action for the weaker sections has been better land reforms have been slightly more implemented there the things are better and these four states things are generally much worse and up tops the list because of that comrade this is the last question so yeah. you have to after this so uh, you said that there is a process of renaming i mean uh, all this dentic science institutes being re renamed under gold water institutes and everything and also rewriting of history that has been going on since Prime Minister Modi was the CM of Gujarat. That has been going on since there. Mm. So, uh, with this going on, and with this WhatsApp university that is, you know, spreading misinformation like anything in this post-truth era, how do we uh, give out, you know, values or lessons of secularism and the right lessons of history, you know, because the youth, young children yeah. who are growing up nowadays, they are learning these things only. So, how do we give them the right lessons? see i think uh, one of the weaknesses of uh, ruling party and the left parties has been that we have ignored this issue like even i felt till 1992 that this is not a issue while rss was working uh, full barrels we were totally ignoring it so they have already sowed lot of this common sense which has to be undone now and that i think the left parties and those people who are really secular must make it a major mission of their life to uh, to uh, take this proper history remove the misconceptions about muslims and christians and that has to be done subjectively there is no automatic mechanism now with this government ruling they are going to do worse and worse and worse but what is in our hand we should try to uh, do it subjectively and so wherever like uh, there are many friends and i am requesting all of that see all your movements you must focus on but in addition try to reduce this hatred and try to reduce the misconceptions without reducing the misconceptions we can't think of a secular society at all because they have been working 95 years round the clock and we have not focused it on it at all so how can we expect to compete with them with in a day we'll have to build up slowly properly the first is we have to recognize the importance of this because we mainly have been raising demands on economic grounds or which are correct but this also has to run parallelly that i think we have ignored and we are suffering because of that particular thing today thank you comrade i mean uh, it will be a very difficult task for comrade shankar das to you know match up the energy level you have produced <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Kamran. Now I invite like Kamran Shankar to give us some more insights into the topic. Welcome, Mr. Shankar. Ah, uh, okay. My voice is clear, audible. Kamran, be honest with me. My, I am audible. Yeah. Okay. You are okay. audible, but it's a bit, you know, some noise is coming. Noise is from the uh, surroundings. <laughs> so, uh, so Kamran and friends. so uh, i like to uh, thank comrade uh, bijalakshmi for her uh, 
fantastic uh, introductory presentation followed by a magnificent uh, speech by ram puniyani ji sir and uh, also a uh, very good uh, that is question and answer session interactive session so now it is uh, after uh, after a uh, speech uh, of uh, ram puniyani ji sir it is always very uh, difficult to uh, say uh, to go into the subject because very few things are left so but i uh, like to put forward some practical experiences because uh, the subject uh, includes the challenges in front of the caste annihilation movement and uh, what are the challenges uh, we are facing that is uh, when we are trying to organize a movement like uh, caste annihilation movement so uh, what are the practical uh, problems we are facing in the field that is also uh, that is uh, one of uh, my uh, point to uh, present so before uh, going into that uh, that thing so i like to say one or two uh, things uh, on uh, ambedkar uh, how we uh, see him uh, from uh, our organization of caste annihilation movement that uh, ambedkar uh, uh, had a uh, uh, departure that is a extremely uh, remarkable thing in uh, ambedkar uh, then his Uh, previous leaders presiders that is uh, he made a departure when he declared that my struggle my struggle is a political struggle and there is a political struggle of the sutras uh, in the introduction of his very famous book who were the sutras he wrote it very clearly that uh, uh, my struggle is a political struggle and this is basically a political struggle of the sutras the political struggle of the sudras what does it mean it means to snatch the power from the brahminist forces to the dalit people dalit people means uh, for ambedkar uh, uh, very rightly ram pudani ji sir said that the dalit people basically were the uh, uh, working class and the toiling masses of our country historically so when he said that uh, the political power must be snatched from the brahminist forces and this is the, the motto of the political struggle of the sudra he made a uh, uh, political departure and that is why this is a significance of ambedkar uh, there was a debate the debate was going on still today that whether ambedkar is a reformist or uh, a revolutionary so this uh, debate is still uh, going on but uh, uh, we can see this aspect of ambedkar that uh, he uh, said very clearly that uh, his struggle is a political struggle and the motto of the struggle and the target of the struggle is the political power so he concentrated uh, very much uh, in this matter to having political power not only just a cultural movement not only just a social movement movement for movement sake no movement for the political power because so long the political power will remain in the hands of the brahminist forces the dalit people they will no hope they will have no hope to uh, any kind of emancipation so this was the uh, great thing in ambedkar and this is the significance of uh, ambedkar uh, <clears throat> coupled with his uh, famous uh, theory of caste annihilation movement uh, so this is the significance of ambedkar and uh, when we are uh, uh, going into the field from our organization caste annihilation movement then uh, what we are seeing today that is a important thing what we are seeing uh, so uh, see uh, rampuniani ji sir said uh, there is a six movements uh, there is a positive movements Uh, progressive movements in the country and which have the potency to change the society yes that is uh, all right but politically uh, if you uh, say politically politically there are in the main there are two uh, movements uh, which uh, have the potency to change the society uh, one is uh, or uh, or uh, and the caste annihilation itself one is the dalit movement itself ambedkar right movement or dalit movement whatever uh, name you use uh, I, i i am using dalit movement so the dalit movement uh, this is a very important movement uh, in our country uh, in respect to the caste annihilation movement 
and another movement is the communist movement uh in our country that, uh, that is also this communist movement has the potency to uh, change the society and uh, especially the caste annihilation movement communist party declared that is the abolition of caste so they uh, used a different word abolition and uh, ambedkar used another word it is annihilation both of the words uh, aimed at the same target that is annihilation of the uh, caste or uh, eradicated the caste division so this was the target of both the uh, movements so when we are uh, in, the, in the caste annihilation movement uh, we have uh, uh, comrades and friends from this both these states uh, we have our uh, friends uh, from uh, dalit movement and we are having our comrades from the communist movement so uh, when we, uh, we are seeing in the field that uh, what is uh, today what is the situation if you judge these two movements uh, separately then uh, what is the what is the scenario today we will see that both the movement uh, are split it into many groups and the parties so this is one of the great uh, difficulties facing uh, by both the movements the uh, movements uh, what ambedkar introduced the political movement of the sutras and he established that uh, ilp independent labor party and later on uh, uh, confederation <coughs> scheduled <coughs> scheduled caste uh, confederation then uh, it was uh, now it is split it in many groups and many parts similarly the communist movement that is also Uh, split it into many groups and the many parties so this is uh, one of the uh, problem which we are uh, seeing we are facing uh, today uh, rightly said by uh, ram punari ji sir that uh, uh, unity is a very important thing uh, marching separately strike together so this is uh, and today what is the situation situation is uh, uh, marching separately and strike separately so this is uh, happening this is the, this is the scenario so in this scenario unity uh, within the communist movement and unity within the dalit movement under a uh, certain uh, specific uh, program of caste annihilation and uh, other things this is very important and we are facing that this is uh, not in the same so this is one problem second problem is widespread opportunism in both the sides in both the movements when we are uh, talking uh, and uh, having discussion and uh, interacting with the say the dalit organization we see that uh, uh, today there is a identity politics uh, is there ambedkar was for annihilation of the caste caste uh, uh, eradicated and the abolition of the caste division itself this was uh, uh, ambedkar's motto but now we are seeing that the uh, a uh, uh, very influential section uh, uh, of dalit movement they are they are not interested in uh, caste uh, annihilation or caste abolition uh, why say i am giving one uh, example that is i remember that uh, after the demise of mother teresa in kolkata the sister nirmala uh, became the uh, supremo so uh, at that uh, that ceremony that uh, a uh, journalist and the press people they uh, asked uh, sister nirmala that uh, you were working for the poor but the uh, percentage of poor people in our country and in the world that is uh, gradually decreasing and uh, some uh, somewhere it is very fast decreasing and uh, at a certain point of time there will be no poor then what you will do so uh, in, uh, very spontaneously and instantly sister nirmala said that uh, no no i will not believe that that uh, uh, poor people will remain uh, that is this uh, uh, this poverty uh, will not be eradicated and poverty will remain and that because, uh, that is why our significance of our presence and our working that will remain intact so uh, so so this is the thing if the caste division is not there is a, a caste uh, really annihilated then the opportunist leaders of the uh, dalit movement what they are uh, seeking there for soon using the uh, caste movement 
uh, casteist movement or caste movement of this type of identity politics, what they are, uh, they are uh, doing today, seeking their fortune in politics, so uh, they will be in so. So that is their, uh, that is why they are not uh, much interested. Uh, uh, that is not all, but a, a section of very influential Dalit leaders. That we are seeing this problem in the Dalit movement. Similarly, in the communist movement, if you see, in the communist movement also, there is a widespread opportunism. In the whole uh, uh, communist party movement, CPI, CPIM, CPML, if you uh, see the whole uh, thing, if you uh, see that, then you will uh, understand that a revolution, a revolutionary change of the uh, human society. So a, a departure from this uh, original notion and the actual target of a communist party that uh, we are seeing. So as a result, we see that uh, uh, a soft Hindutva uh, gradually uh, uh, hold its uh, domination in in the in all sort of mainstream party that is the uh, ruling parties it is it was uh, quite natural but at the same time uh, in uh, uh, the communist movement also this is a, a most unfortunate uh, thing that is in communist movement also this opportunism this uh, soft hindutva uh, these all things are uh, dominism casteism uh, all type of thing huh? Uh, sexist uh, attitude, all these things are uh, going on uh, rampant. If I use this word, I think that uh, mm, this is uh, uh, this is true. Because uh, there is no check and balance system. Ideologically, there, if there is no fight, ideologically, if there is no counterattack, then what happens? You, you uh, have to uh, uh, surrender the, uh, to the Brahminism and the Brahministic ideology, because this ideology is the ruling class ideology. And what Marx said that the uh, dominating uh, ideology in the society is uh, comes from the dominating class, dominating social forces. So in our society, since the dominating forces till today, they are the uh, Brahminist uh, forces. So their ideology, the Brahminism, is also a dominating uh, ideology uh, throughout the society. So uh, it's very strong counter attack from the part of uh, uh, the struggling people, especially these two forces, this uh, Dalit movements and from the communist movement was expected. But we are seeing that there is great uh, lacking in this uh, thing. Third uh, uh, problem what we are facing, that is there is no unity between these two, this uh, Dalit movement and this uh, communist movement. Historically, uh, we know that uh, there was uh, initially there was uh, cooperation sometimes when ambedkar was there ambedkar communist uh, relation was uh, going through sometimes uh, through cooperation sometimes through contradiction however the problem is that the what uh, it was indicated uh, not elaborated but indicated by rampune and Jisar, that the communist uh, party uh, they are uh, uh, extreme, did extremely uh, uh, fantastic uh, uh, yeah, uh, work. Uh, a lot of glorious past the Communist Party has. But the, one of the very important uh, failure uh, of Communist Party is to understand uh, the country where they were deputed to revolt, to change the society. To understand the society, understand the country, understand the history. So this is a, a very uh, important uh, lacuna of uh, communist movement. However, if we see that in case of Ambedkar, this is another significance of Ambedkar, that when Ambedkar uh, developed his uh, theoretical uh, edifice, he uh, uh, tried to understand the his historical continuity of uh, Indian uh, scenario, uh, society. From uh, in his magnificent uh, write up, that is, uh, who were the Sudras, he summed up all Brahmanical uh, literature. And uh, he showed that uh, who, are, uh, who were the Sudras. He, you may uh, agree or disagree, but uh, uh, what he did, he uh, 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 tried to catch the continuity of Indian uh, society. That is a very important thing. So, uh, the relation between Buddhism and Ambedkar, it was not uh, uh, an accidental thing. 
it was there was a uh, uh, it, is, it is a deep rooted uh, relation uh, i believe so uh, it was also rooted uh, to understand the uh, uh, indian history if you uh, read the uh, very fantastic book of ambedkar that is a revolution and counter revolution in ancient india then you see how uh, he uh, described the uh, buddhist upsurge as a revolution as a uh, revolution like french revolution uh, ambedkar was very fond of french revolution and he said that the buddhist revolution was a uh, french revolution like revolution in india and the monoism or monosriti uh, it uh, ap uh, appeared at, uh, as a counter revolution and the age of counter revolution continues so uh, so this is the seeing the history in its continuity so here the communist uh, party has this lacuna so uh, therefore the problem uh, definitely uh, came up and uh, there was uh, no very strong unity could not be built between uh, ambedkar movement and the communist movement and till today that is the most unfortunate thing that till today that uh, no in, uh, very uh, feeble initiative i should not say no initiative but a very feeble initiative was taken by uh, by the intellectuals ideologues and the uh, leaders uh, from the both the camp therefore as a result a deep rooted mistrust uh, remains in bo in in both the sides when you are, we are talking uh, to the dalit uh, uh, friends uh, friends from the dalit movements they have a uh, we we feel that they have a very uh, deep rooted mistrust to the communist and we, when you are talking to the communist we will feel that communist are not giving much uh, importance uh, that much importance to the uh, dalit movement so so this this type of things uh, is remaining so as a result these two most important movements in india against caste annihilation and uh, uh, caste uh, politics and uh, and all sort of uh, unjust in the society these two important movements are still today are remaining separate so that is one of the uh, biggest uh, challenge uh, we are facing today in the practical life so when we uh, try to build up our organization uh, caste annihilation movement uh, from, uh, by the comrades from the dalit movement and the from the communist movement both then uh, we tried Uh, continuously to upgrade our understanding that what are our past uh, lacunas because understanding past um, sometimes it is said that uh, forget past uh, etc but what our understanding is that uh, uh, understanding lacunas what we did in the past uh, and if we ca cannot rectify those errors then we cannot go ahead so uh, in order to going ahead Uh, and to unite these two important movements in india we uh, need to understand the, what were the problems what are the mistakes we did in the past and then only we can rectify those mistakes at present and then we can uh, build a correct or a right or just future uh, through our movement so uh, here comes uh, the fourth challenges that is uh, extreme theoretical ideological chaos that is uh, prevailing all over the uh, struggling uh, camp struggle is not only the uh, struggle uh, uh, physical struggle physical struggle yes physical struggle uh, is a very important thing but a correct physical struggle cannot be done if the theoretical struggle uh, cannot be done uh, did not uh, carry forward properly without the theoretical struggle without the theoretical understanding very clear theoretical understanding no action will be correct so this is said by uh, both by uh, buddha and uh, marxist leaders like marx uh, and uh, lenin lenin the very uh, uh, famous lenin speech is there that without the uh, revolutionary theory no re uh, revolutionary movement is possible this is a very uh, famous uh, speech by lenin and uh, uh, gautama buddha he also said the same thing 2500 years back he said that the ignorance is the mother of all sufferings so uh, if you understand this this thing in such a way in this angle that uh, uh, if we do not have the right approach to the society if we do not have the right point of view then uh, all of our action whatever we do and most vigorously we do most harmful if our thinking is not correct 
So we are seeing the widespread theoretical ideological cap now in both the camp, in uh, the Dalit movement and in the communist movement. If you see Ambedkar, what, what he did, uh, Ramkunyani ji sir said very correctly, that his writings uh, are massive. He wrote a lot of things and he studied a lot of things. And the study and practical work, practical struggle and theoretical struggle went hand in hand for him. And if we see the communist movement also, in the communist movement, uh, in the past, the communist leaders and the communist uh, party, they did the same thing. No, no practical work without the theoretical work. Theoretical work and the practical work went hand in hand for Lenin. For all the uh, stalwarts of the communist movement internationally. But what we, we are seeing today? We are seeing today that uh, uh, a lot of struggles are going on, a lot of, lot of activities are going on. But in both the camps, there is uh, no that, that type of uh, ideological and theoretical work. You, you, can you believe uh, uh, or uh, do you see that a person has come up from the Dalit movement and he has studied so much and uh, writing so much uh, with so much depth uh, like Ambedkar? Are you seeing that? And in the same thing is uh, happening in the communist movement also. So therefore, wh what is happening actually? We are continuing our mistake. We are continuing our, our errors. Repeating the uh, errors, error is okay because uh, a person who works he will definitely commit mistakes but if you can if you will not check your mistake if you will not rectify your mistake if you will continue your mistakes then it is a crime it is said by lenin this is a crime and this, this crime we are doing we are not rectifying our mistake we are not analyzing our uh, uh, past we, we are always we are scared when you are talking about unity we are talking unity that is an opportunistic unity. We are not uh, 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 daringly taking up the task to analyze the mistake. If, if I did any mistake, uh, self-criticism uh, is the uh, way out. So uh, that is also the uh, teachings of Gautama Buddha. So uh, uh, these things are not we are uh, seeing in the same. So in this scenario, uh, when we are trying to develop that caste annihilation movement, this caste annihilation movement, from this caste annihilation movement, we are facing tremendous change. So, uh, a continuous uh, theoretical uh, uh, and ideological theoretical counter attack, not only against mo uh, monoism, there is a huge task to attack the Brahminist forces. This is a huge task. Uh, but at the same time, that uh, a big uh, chunk of our uh, uh, energy should be invested to uh, analyze our activities and uh, uh, upgrade our theoretical and ideological position also. That is the two-way task in front of us. Gita uh, very rightly said, uh, Rampuri Anaji sir, Gita, Gita, Gita is not only, uh, Gita is a monosliti, Gita is a Brahministic, uh, okay, but Gita has a special thing in it. Gita is a justification of genocide. When the Kurukshetra war was just going to start, Arjuna uh, asked uh, Krishna that uh, I, I, will, I, I cannot kill my uh, kinsmen. Then Krishna, at that time Krishna gave his speech, that was the Gita. And the crux of the, this thing is that uh, uh, you cannot decide that uh, to whom you, you will kill or not. Because yeah, you are killing, but you, you cannot kill. So this is the theory of uh, immortal uh, Brahma, the Parabrahma and the Jivatma, or, uh, Paramatma and Jivatma, and the relation between Jivatma and Paramatma, and the whole uh, Vedantic uh, philosophy was put forward by um, Lord Krishna. And basically, it was a justification of genocide. You cannot kill anybody because Atma ya Paramatma cannot kill anybody and cannot be killed by anybody. So what you were saying that you were killing, but actually you, you cannot kill. But then, then you can kill. Genocide was justified just before of the Kurushetra work. That was Gita. 
So today, uh, um, uh, communists have a very big uh, lacuna in this field also. They did not analyze this uh, Brahministic literature and they just forget it. They, they, they just shun it. They just uh, uh, putting it aside, saying that all this relig religious thing, uh, we should not go into it. But if you do not go into it, you cannot analyze it uh, dialectically. You cannot expose it and uh, a true attack against the Brahministic philosophy and Brahministic literature cannot be done. And this task was taken up by Ambedkar. That was a um, uh, very, very, very significant thing uh, of Ambedkar. So now, today, if we can take up this thing uh, jointly, a movement, a social movement, uh, uh, constituting uh, from both the sides, this uh, uh, Dalit forces and the communist forces, and if this movement, if this, if this movement can take up this uh, task to expose the Brahministic literature, to analyze the Brahministic literature and the counter attack, and the Brahministic literature, and at the same time, uh, uh, rectifying our past error, uh, upgrading our theoretical and uh, ideological uh, uh, structure, uh, then definitely a new movement, a new hope, a new silver line will uh, come up in the society. We have started this uh, job in the uh, caste annihilation movement with our very uh, small uh, uh, strength and uh, uh, persons like Ramkunyani ji sir and a uh, lot of other intellectuals from the society are helping us and we will uh, definitely look uh, we'll, uh, we'll looking for, we'll be looking for their help continuous help uh, in this subject and uh, this theoretical uh, up upgradation and the counter attack of uh, uh, brahministic uh, monobadi theoretical base uh, of rss so we will uh, very much grateful to this uh, uh, intellectuals of the society who, who are coming uh, coming up with our help. So, uh, co uh, comrades and friends, this is my uh, just uh, short, short presentation. So, if there is any question, then uh, I will try to uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, comrade, for that presentation. Of course, we have questions. You don't mind. <laughs> so, the first question is: Is in the caste marriage just the solution to caste annihilation? Not fully, not fully, but definitely it will uh, serve uh, uh, a portion of the purpose because you know the attack, what Ram Kunyaniji sir again, uh, he uh, indicated very uh, correctly, that is the uh, main attack of the Brahminist forces against the uh, women. Why? Because when the structure they, uh, they prefer, the social structure, uh, caste divided or varna divided, varna caste divided uh, social, st social structure. This structure can be jeopardized by the women. If the inter caste marriages are taking place very frequently, then there is no question of this uh, caste division. Because you know that uh, Ambedkar uh, wrote in his book, that is uh, uh, Revolution and Counter Revolution in Ancient India, he showed that uh, before uh, Manu, before Guru, there are many uh, important uh, 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 Vedic personality. They uh, had their uh, partners from the different uh, varnas, like Sant Santonu, Parasar, and there are Jajati. There are many, many, many names uh, he quoted. But after Manu, Manu understood that because it is a counter revolution to counter the Buddhist revolution. And uh, what Buddhism did? Buddhism. Uh, totally rejected this uh, caste uh, division in the society. And uh, when uh, Manu Sridi came and the uh, Manuist counter revolution uh, came into being, then uh, it uh, stressed on the uh, strict uh, this thing, this Varnasam uh, system. And uh, the attack of the women uh, came as a part of it because they understood, they realized that women is a very important social force which can jeopardize the whole system. So today, if we uh, can promote this, the, uh, uh, yes, this is this will serve a purpose. But the thing is that today, after 2,500 years, today the whole system is so much institutionalized and uh, uh, so much interlinked with the whole social structure, economy, culture, uh, 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 theory, uh, understanding. All the things are interrelated and it uh, formed a very concrete uh, uh, 
uh, thing structure so just only one step will not be enough to uh, demolish the uh, this uh, caste system all the combining effort all uh, all states all type of states the combining effort of all type of states will uh, necessarily i think it is necessary yes uh, your answer brought me to the next question so uh, you said that the agency of the women that is what it is supposed to be increased when you conduct intercaste marriages and also uh, interreligious marriages so uh, do you think that i mean uh, Once when I was talking to a friend, he was in love with a girl of a different caste. Okay, but he did not want. To, I mean, he couldn't marry her because the parents were against that in the, in the caste marriage. So he was supporting in the caste marriage, but he wanted to remain in the structure of family, and he wasn't ready to go against that. So in this Indian setup, do you think that family as a structure is perpetuating the system of caste hierarchy? yes there is a uh, relation uh, between uh, family not only the caste system but uh, all of our economic uh, base and and the superstructure of the whole society is uh, related with the family system uh, also because you know that uh, since personally as a person i am a marxist so i can uh, say that uh, when uh, marx said that uh, what is the base of this society ha uh, many people later uh, con uh, con become confused and uh, uh, misinterpreted what marx said that economy uh, what uh, uh, marx uh, as if marx said that economy is the base of the society uh, marx did not say that economy is the base of the society marx said that production and reproduction uh, of the uh, uh, immediate life production and reproduction of the immediate life is the base of the society and this production and reproduction of immediate life has two fold character it uh, one side there is production and reproduction of means of subsistence that is uh, uh, clothing or uh, food that is economy and another thing is that production and reproduction by species itself so when you are going into this production and reproduction of the species itself then definitely we will uh, enter the history of uh, family and we will see that this family uh, along with economy uh, similar uh, with equal importance uh, it uh, has the very big uh, influence over whole society the whole superstructure of the society so the family system also is uh, playing a very important part in our uh, what you are saying that is i am saying that uh, 25 or 30 years back when i was uh, uh, around 20 years uh, of age the bollywood film the uh, bollywood film hindi film uh, there was a, a trend that is uh, rejecting the family rejecting the society jamana kya kahega to aapko aage badhna hai to what what may be the jamana say the family rejecting the family many people from uh, calcutta they uh, left home and they uh, try to uh, go to uh, mumbai because there is an attraction for the young people to rejecting the rejecting family means what rejecting family means actually it was a symbol to rejecting the conservatism which uh, <clears throat> try to remain the society intact so this reactionary Uh, element in the society rejecting the reactionary element in the society rejecting the status quo it was equal to uh, rejecting the family so it was a trend of uh, 1980s uh, bollywood film but now the reverse uh, is taking place what rampuni energy sir rightly pointed out that after 1980s and especially after 90s especially uh, with the uh, joining hand with neoliberalism in our uh, country so what we are saying the upsurge of all sort of uh, reactionary ideology now today uh, the child are saying that i cannot marry you or i cannot uh, love uh, you fall in love with you because uh, of my family so this was quite unthinkable uh, when i was uh, uh, of my age of let's uh, say 20 or this something like that so, so this is the this is this this is this is happening actually
Dr. Punyani ji, would you like to make a comment? <laughs> Uh, I know you're married. Uh, I know you're working through your world. It's really important. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, uh, uh, actually, it is a personal choice. It's not connected. In that sense, just keep me in contact. Uh, that is the beauty of industrialization and the modern society. That uh, by force of circumstances, you are dealing with people of different things. and friendship and depth of friendship comes naturally at that time so stopping actually i will say the other way around stopping the intercaste marriage or interreligion marriage is artificial in this society their occurrence is natural their occurrence is natural and stopping them is because of a agenda as i point out that uh, uh, choosing one's partner by a girl choosing by one's partner by a girl particularly is very uh, against the patriarchal norms and i did not point out this thing that any uh, politics in the name of religion goes along with patriarchy and patriarchy wants to control the lives of women and whenever there is patriarchy they want to totally control the uh, choices of the girl etc etc so obviously i feel it is uh, uh, unnatural it is unnatural in a uh, modern industrial society that's what i feel and what i think comrade has pointed out very well i will go further to say that uh, intercaste interreligion marriage is a natural thing stopping it is a ideological maneuver by patriarchal forces or communal forces yes yes my next question will be to both of you i'll ask dr punyani ji to come in first and ask comrade shankar mm. to come in after that is it okay mm. yeah yeah okay okay so uh, well even the leftist leaders at present are holding on to surnames like uh, choudhary chatterjee chakravarti trivedi <laughs> tripathi whatever and celebrate festivals like diwali and holi even after knowing what they stand for how do we expect the dalits to believe that we are against caste yeah that is a very good question and the biggest example i'll tell you jawaharlal nehru jawaharlal nehru who was so much for uh, scientific temper we always remember him as pandit nehru though in his own actions and all that he was against all these systems and uh, of course surname and all that is a second thing but lately of course from last uh, decade or two i feel very reluctant to celebrate festivals like holi or diwali seeing the background meaning of that but uh, again you know festivals have again two aspects one aspect is a religious meaning and second aspect is a social i think uh, what we celebrate despite knowing the meaning of that is a social aspect where we come close to the people in a, in a social form that needs to be examined but keeping the surnames uh, i think uh, it should be innocuous in in my my understanding because what determines your thinking uh, is not your surname what determines your thinking is your life action your understanding at a different level so surnames of course i won't be so objecting to and even social aspects of festival i will not be so much against to but the religious meaning of those festivals i'll definitely stand to oppose it and of course at one level because of like uh, in bengal or durga puja or uh, diwali all over the country it is whatever be the story that mahishasur and other the story once uh, i went into the depth of it one doesn't feel like uh, being a part of it but uh, there is another part that uh, unless we communicate that properly the social meaning of that of uh, interacting with people should not get lost uh, in our uh, this understanding complete uh, but i mean in india the surname is what people usually identify you by they don't go for the first name you know i mean you say sharma ji ka beta when the first time you say dialogue you know uh, not you, you don't call ram sharma ka beta so that is See, there, you know there i will say there i will say this process of secularization has not gone far in india like in us if you see in britain generally people are addressed by their first name thomas or john here addressing people by first name uh, has two problems one is that it is not supposed to be a sign of respect while names are meant to be used to be called like that but uh, here probably because of this is difficult question probably because of the persistence of secularization uh, secularization process not being complete probably 
those trends are continuing in the society your surnames do carry a equal weight etc etc while it should go away it should go away i think don't you think that until the time comes when it is not gone away we as leftists should avoid using surnames very good very good see there is a good uh, deal of friends in left movement particularly the socialist movement they don't use their surname like one of my friends is there uh, her name is lata pm lata pm pm stand p stands for her mother's name m stands for her father's name so ravindra rp ravindra rp ravindra is his name and r is his mother's name p is his father's name so many people i think this is a very healthy trend and i support what you are saying we should also try to have uh, our names popularized in that particular way but by the time we come up all our school certificates are ready and those things are there so that creates a practical problem but uh, having uh, understood it many of my friends in maharashtra are using names like this so yesterday only i had a webinar where lata pm was the convener the way you are convener today so she uh, lata pramila madhukar Pramila is mother's name. Madhukar is her father's name. So that that is a, is a good pattern. That's a good pattern. Okay, comrade. Now I'll move on to comrade Shankar and let him answer the same question. Comrade Shankar, do I need to repeat? No, no, no. That is okay. But actually, uh, see, comrade, the uh, whole thing is very much uh, uh, complicated. Uh, also, that was uh, rightly said by uh, Rampuriani ji, sir. That is the uh, this is a very complicated uh, thing. actually the communist people they uh, they start uh, they, they did that they uh, sand that is a sacred threat of the brahmin they uh, rejected and burned so and uh, reject uh, rejecting the religious uh, program religious gathering and religious festival so uh, they uh, all they did and they are continuously a uh, large section i will say that large section uh, of them they are doing that they are not participating in the uh, religious uh, program and the religious uh, ceremonies religious any kind of thing so uh, but the problem is that is uh, in our country you know that uh, what uh, rampuriani ji sir said that is actually all these things are so much institutionalized socialized say in our society all the say if you were uh, 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 from a hindu family then uh, most of the festivals are related to the uh, hindu religion and uh, if you are from the muslim family then most of their uh, social festivals they are uh, related to the uh, islam so uh, these things are now today uh, that was the culture of uh, our country that uh, again i am saying that rampuriya ji sir said and indicated that uh, this is a culture this was a culture of our uh, society that uh, mixing participating uh, both the communities or all the communities in a festival of a particular community and making it not uh, not only limited uh, not only within a community it was a general uh, social ceremony uh, converting it so this was a practice in uh, all sort of thing Uh, in bengal uh, i am from bengal so in bengal uh, we are seeing that this is the long history of this type of uh, uh, mixing and there are a lot of songs also which are saying that in the past how uh, beautiful our lives were in our uh, festival a muslim uh, is uh, singing that our festival the hindu people uh, uh, used to join and they uh, used to invite us in their uh, festival so making the festival not only for the hindus or uh, muslims but the whole uh, of the village so this was this is a uh, automatic culture and a spontaneous culture in our society and this culture was uh, broken uh, consciously by the uh, colonial uh, forces british and all that was said by rampuriani ji sir so now uh, now what is the problem problem is that now uh, all uh, big festivals are related with the religion religion uh, uh, religious meaning uh, religious ceremonies and this type of thing so de demarcating separating the festival from its religion religious thing is very difficult so many people i i see uh, although they are not religious people and they are atheist and they are against religion and they are signing all type of religious uh, activities and religious this thing but they some kind of participation in the in the process 
uh, is taking place. So long uh, until and uh, unless the whole society uh, radically changed, this problem will remain. But the fight against that, even the individual fight, fight against that is also very important. That is uh, signing the surname. Uh, you will face the problem. I know that one of the communist couple, uh, one of my communist uh, friends, a couple, they uh, named uh, uh, their child uh, in the name of a river. The first name and the surname, both of the name, uh, they took from the name of, of the river. And, uh, but uh, faced huge difficulties to get uh, her, uh, that uh, child, uh, to get her admitted in the school. At the time of <laughs> admission, that uh, the authority, uh, when the name was written and uh, in the form, uh, they was uh, some kind of uh, terrified. What type of name it is? What type of people they were? Uh, so, <laughs> so, so these type of things are happening in our society every day in every state. You will uh, have to face a huge difficulties in uh, if you go for your passport. And there are if there are two diverse name, a first name from a river Ganga Jamuna. So nobody will believe you. Nobody will trust you. So these type of things are there. So, so huge difficulties we are facing. But the passport is required for some um, for many reasons. Say you have to uh, uh, participate in a uh, conference of a international conference or something like that. You have to go. So passport is required. But the, your name is Ganga Jamuna. So that is a problem. So this type of a lot of difficulties uh, are there in the society. So uh, in spite of that, all individual battles, individual struggles are important, but you cannot bang on it. So solely you cannot bang on it. You have to develop the radical movement, the movement which have the potency to change the whole society radically. If you cannot develop this type of uh, movement with only the individual efforts, just rejecting the surname or, or something like that, uh, it will uh, not possible to demolish the whole structure. But at the same time, I am repeatedly, uh, repeatedly I am saying that it is very important for all individual efforts, all individual struggles, single uh, effort. That is very uh, important also. But it is not sufficient. Congress, uh, when this, uh, you know, discrimination or uh, increasing atrocities against minorities started, there was this uh, image that was in circulation, you know, on the first stage of filtration, that is during the CANRC riot, I mean, uh, before the riot, I mean, in time of filtration, there was this filtration system. The first system was, you know, on the basis of minorities. And after that, that is on the basis of caste. And after that, it is on the basis of complexion. You know, do you, do you think that that is really a start of such a trend that is happening? Huh, yes. Actually, uh, actually, you were, uh, one thing was uh, discussed by Ram Puneriji, sir, that is the, uh, why Uttar Pradesh? We are talking about Uttar Pradesh, the importance of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, see, this is the, this is the culture of the, this is the Vedic culture, you know. The Vedic culture, that is a dominating culture. Uh, till today and uh, especially it was uh, promoted it is promoted by the uh, uh, subtle fascist forces the Vedic culture is basically a culture of white people male Vedic people they did not have uh, uh, important female uh, goddess goddess if you uh, come to Kolkata you will see Durga Kali and uh, and the whole uh, this uh, section, this uh, god and goddess, they are dominated by the female in the uh, east, eastern side of the country. But uh, in, if you uh, uh, go to the north and the northwest side, this side, which was called uh, Aryavarta, Aryavarta, where uh, uh, Aryan people, they uh, established uh, their uh, dominance. This is Aryavarta. This Aryavarta basically uh, was uh, dominated by the Aryan culture. This Aryan culture is the culture of the white people. This culture is, uh, is culture of the male. And this culture is uh, basically idealist, uh, uh, philosophically idealist. So today, we also see the same continuation. 
and uh, promoted heavily by the uh, fascist forces. That is, uh, uh, Mel, in the Vedas, if you study Rig Veda, now, what Rig Veda is saying, that is a very much uh, violent, very much violent against those who were not non-Vedic. At that time, the uh, idol worshippers were non-Vedic. And uh, these Vedic people, they were not idol worshippers. So, this is opposite. Today, uh, the uh, yeah, um, uh, Muslims, they are not idol worshippers. But the Hindu, uh, this thing, they are idol worshippers. But at that time, the Vedic uh, uh, people, they were not idol worshippers. And the yeah, uh, uh, non-Vedic people, uh, they were idol worshippers. So they are saying in the, uh, in the Rig Veda, so let the idol worshipper uh, destructed, uh, 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 kill them, uh, kill them, uh, uh, let them drown in the water. So all this type of violent uh, expression against them there. So this continuation is there against uh, minorities, religious minorities and all. This type you will see the same kind, same uh, con uh, with this, uh, with the continuity, this uh, same kind of uh, vigor or uh, 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 violence uh, you will see against this minority people, against this, against the women, against the women, against the minority, and against the dark, I mean the skin uh, color. So this is the continuation of the uh, uh, Vedic culture. Uh, uh, and later it was uh, heavily promoted by the Vedantic, Vedantic people philosophically and the, uh, then Sankaracharya uh, before Sankaracharya there are a lot of other uh, yeah, yeah, uh, teachers in the Vedantic uh, sect and uh, then uh, Sankaracharya and after Sankaracharya uh, uh, via Vivekananda till uh, today RSS so this continuation this is actually very much biased to the male biasness is there. Indra, what Indra did in the in Rig Veda, very, uh, very, very much a glorification of Indra uh, in Rig Veda. And what Indra did, there was a battle against Indra and Usha. And uh, Indra defeated Usha and they raped her. And this was said uh, in Rig Veda with uh, much uh, celebration that how Indra uh, raped uh, Usha. So the, all these type of things are a part of Vedic culture. So this culture is continuing today through RSS, through the fascist forces. And they are uh, taking it in its uh, highest uh, peak. Uh, you rightly pointed out Vedas, you know, and Puranas. Because when I used to read it, I used to think that, I mean, one time the Sindra goes and rapes some Maharshi's wife, and he repeats the same. And then, you know, Mahavishnu, Narada has to go to Mahavishnu and then he has to come and save him or otherwise he gives him a curse and then that becomes a story. So this is, this goes on and on, you know. So this is like yes. old testament of Indian Puranas. Yes. I mean, all you see is this type of incident. That's it. There is no role of the women being played over there, even during Vedic times also. The only uh, names that we hear during Upanishadic times are of Gargi and Maitre. No other women are being mentioned. They are not I mean, allowed to study also. So yeah, you mentioned it right. So yes. uh, my yes. question is to Dr. Uh, Dr. Rampunyani. So uh, sir, uh, we have seen that uh, these days, uh, when you said that this commandal politics that was rising, there was also this VR films I don't remember whether it was Mahabharata or Ramayana that was being shown every Sunday in the morning. There used to be, you know, Pura Sandartha Chajata, so that's how it used to be. So, ever since then, there has been a rise of religious entertainment sector, you know, in either in the form of series or in the form of films, it has been on the rise. And this has led to a different set of icons for the youth and the children. Because in the beginning we had icons like Nehru or Ambedkar, we used to be attached to them. But after that we used to get attached to, you know, we are, uh, you, uh, I mean, people are so fond of having tattoos of Shiva in, or, you know, having Ganja or, you know, all sort of stuff, all sort of wild stuff they're having. So they have got icons like this on one hand and why aren't we able to, you know, provide icons, alternate icons, because, I remember a time when uh, our icons used to be Chiguera or, you know, somebody of an intellectual cal caliber, not like this. This is a mystery. Um, as, as I told you, the decade of 1980s 
lot of things which promoted uh, religiosity came up one is this ramayan first ramayan maha serial went on every sunday there is a curfew on the road then mahabharat followed then similar serials followed then there is another two things which we don't realize one is that there is a press called geeta press in gorakhpur from where yogi adityanath comes now they come out with very small slim books based on manusmriti and rigvedas and vedas like one book i came across was bhartiya mahilaon ke kartavya bharti nari ke kartavya means is a small book and you know what is the print order print order of her the book was 5 lakh copies sold i as a author struggle to sell my 1000 copies and here this book costing 5 rupees 80 pages and giving all manusmriti things in a simple language so geeta press has played a role then you remember amar chitra katha i never realized this before but amar chitra katha also became very popular and it has also a sort of a brahminical tilt to the most of the stories so you know this count actually i feel like calling all this uh, there is a direction i want to say that uh, 1947 independence was a sort of a mini revolution mini revolution which unleashed the path of slight equality for women dalits adivasi worker slight slight don't don't misunderstand me i know comrades don't cannot compromise anything short of october revolution i know that so that was a mini revolution and then there was a counter revolution which came up in this form which is in the form of what babri mosque demolition then uh, geeta press books ramayan mahabharat so that is actually as a comrade referred to uh, 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 buddha's coming as revolution manusmriti coming as counter revolution so sometimes i feel like saying that in 1950s we saw a mini revolution where nehru said nehru said these our dams industrial development to add and universities these are our temples and after 1980s people are saying oh our our temples are underneath the mosque so break the mosque and along with that all these narrations which are changing our national icons now like you see gandhi whatever we we, we have lot of criticism of gandhi but gandhi definitely played a strong anti imperialist anti colonial role now even gandhi is not much respected nehru is strongly demonized ambedkar they have to forcibly remember because and without that they can't get the votes of dalits and who remembers bhagat singh occasionally people like you and me of course bhagat singh i think should be icon number 1 as we are concerned bhagat singh should be our day to day icon and hero but you are very correct in saying that somehow this uh, counter revolution is not just at the level of atrocities against muslims dalits domination of women it is also accompanied by all these cultural things which have been promoted unconsciously there is a wonderful book i came across by akshay mukul on geeta press i never realized it right from my childhood i was fond of reading ramayan mahabharat from geeta books but then if you see when i at one station i saw that book bharti nari ke kartavya jati vyavastha brahmano ka karm all these books and they are sold in lakhs and lakhs comrade we are very happy that we have distributed 1000 leaflets we are very happy we are very happy that our red star magazine has a circulation of 500 1000 and here you see that press is working from last 50 years people go for pilgrimage to all this haridwar alabad and women bring these books for the family so obviously ramayan mahabharat is not alone along with that i'm just supplementing to what you said you made a very correct point that this has changed our mindset also towards the brahminical direction and most of these values certainly give the brahminical message at one level amar chitra katha will give the message of anti anti islam anti christianity that is another way so all this they are, they actually marching they are marching hand in hand from last especially after 1980s so at one level i have to say as there was a counter revolution to buddhism so there is a counter revolution to our freedom movement and that counter revolution has come up in the form of advani vajpayee rath yatra babri demolition and all parallel ideological constructs which have aided them very strongly 
uh, comrades, we are approaching the end of our time. So it was a very refreshing session, at least for me. I mean, I got to know a lot of things and this is the first time getting to have such a session, you know, I'm so thankful to you. And I guess the viewers will also be so much grateful to you for sharing your insights. And now I invite Comrade Lakshmiya to give the word of thanks. Comrade Lakshmiya. Comrade Lakshmiya, are you not there? He was supposed to be here. Comrade Lakshmiya? Ah, comrade. Yeah, please, please. Uh, yeah, you are ah, invited please, to the uh, Today, the webinar challenges the anti caste movement in our uh, India. The uh, uh, analytical speakers uh, who are participating, and I great uh, uh, thanks to. Uh, Rampuni and Sir and uh, Shankar Das, who are participating in this webinar also uh, from our caste annihilation movement. I create thankful to Rampuni and Sir. Uh, today, <clears throat> there is a big challenge before us because uh, the anti fascist uh, forces in our India and also political power of all states and uh, center. Uh, captured by the uh, um, um, fascist forces. So, in our India, in 1925, the Communist Party uh, has established, and also in that time, the RSS also established. The RSS um, captured the political power, but we, um, from working class or poor people, or uh, marginalized sections, we are not captured the political power. That is why there is a lack of uh, ideological struggle in our uh, India. The, um, that is why we try to um, alternate uh, ideological struggle and uh, alternate uh, 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 struggles in our India. So there is a two-point program. Uh, Ambedkar said that there, there is a there are so many inequalities the gender inequalities cultural inequalities economical inequalities political inequalities uh, that is why we working against inequalities in our india and also we make intercaste marriages these are the two um, programs uh, said by ambedkar that is why we strengthen the thoughts of Ambedkar and we followed the uh, thoughts of Ambedkar. So I uh, thankful to once again, I thankful uh, Rampunyan sir because Rampunyan sir is one of the great person he is uh, uh, working against uh, Hindu fascism, cultural uh, Hindu nationalism also he is speaking and working. That is why he is a dear person because they are uh, oh, uh, fascist forces are attacking some Pansare, uh, like uh, uh, Dabolkar, uh, and also uh, Punyani Sar is a great uh, person because he is uh, facing the, those forces and uh, fascist forces. That is why I, I am thankful to uh, Ram Punyani Sar and uh, Sankar Das and chairperson of uh, our moderator Vijay Lakshmi also. Uh, from our organization, All India Caste Innovation Movement. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, come Thank you very Jalakshmi. much. Come. I enjoyed being with you people. <laughs> Thank uh, you very much, sir. <laughs> hope we continue to interact. Okay. Hope we continue yes, to interact. Yes, yes. yes. And Aapko remind me to send my booklet. Okay. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you.